Hi, so uh, John Hug from VoltDB. I'm going to talk a little bit about stream processing, which is a new talk. Uh, I have 20 minutes, so um, what I'm going to try to cover is where did VoltDB come from, what motivated it, um, how people started using VoltDB that surprised us, uh, what kinds of things we did to embrace those use cases, and then I'm going to trash some other systems. <laughs> so history of VoltDB started with a kind of this cabal of smart people of which uh, Mike Stonebreaker is probably the most famous, but really, you know, a, a really solid effort by a team, um, had come off some success with the C-Store and the Vertica project. So I know that uh, Derek talked about Vertica today. And uh, Vertica was this idea that if you built a system just for analytics, uh, not as a general purpose system, could you be 10x faster, 50x faster than existing systems? And so coming off that success saying, hey, we did it, um, they looked next to the, the sort of the other half of that as at the time viewed by, by this group. Um, what about transaction processing? So to, to do that, to build a system that's, that's specific for transaction processing, they asked kind of, well, what, what, what can we assume that's different in 2008? So this is my 2008 time machine slide. Um, and the question they asked is, well, what kind of a system could you build if state fit in memory? Uh, and you can argue until the cows come home about whether your data set fits in memory or not and what kind of data sets fits in memory. Um, that's a whole other discussion. A lot of data sets do fit in memory. Being you know, around all the Facebook people is a little bit kind of reality distortion, but uh, you know, it, it's definitely an interesting problem space. So what they did was they took a legacy system and they took one that was open source. They started with Shore, uh, which code-wise looks a lot like Oracle or SQL Server, but they don't have access to those. Uh, and they just shoved it on a RAM disk, and then they measured where does it spend its time, right? So it gets faster when you put it on a RAM disk, but it doesn't get 50x faster, it turns out. Anybody who's taken MySQL and give a huge cache finds, well, it doesn't actually get 100 times faster. It's not as fast as the RAM makes it. So one of the things it spent its time was in buffer pool management, and that's really easy to fix. You just use memory, don't have a buffer pool. All right, uh, moving on. The, the bigger thing that was, that was problematic is dealing with concurrency. So there's two aspects to concurrency when they put these systems in RAM. One of them is, is shared access to memory. So these are concurrent data structures like concurrent B trees. Uh, they add a lot of overhead, all those, all those actual uh, mutexes and locks. And the, the other component is logical locks for transaction management on row level locking, table level locking, latching on, on various data structures, um, things implemented not in the kernel but in, in user space. All these things were what was preventing this system from being 100 times faster on memory. So uh, came to the same conclusion that the crazy node people came to. Um, run single-threaded. Uh, this has been popular. I think Redis does this. A lot of systems do this. When you write special purpose single-threaded software, it's kind of astounding what a modern CPU can do. Um, so that, that basically solves the concurrency problem, right? Uh, so there's two problems. One is that waiting on users leaves the CPU idle. If you support kind of a hibernate or a user says begin transaction, run these queries, get the results, decide to commit, decide to abort. Um, you can't run single threaded that way because you end up waiting for the user. Network round trips take forever. Your performance is terrible. Uh, the other problem is that you know I have a thousand cores on my phone right now. And single threaded, uh, when you have a system like VoltDB that's transactional, that has shared state, that does real distributed transactions, um, you need to do more than single threaded. So waiting on users, we just decided not to do it. Um, generally, waiting on users in the middle of a transaction is antithetical to getting high performance out of a lot of these systems. It's one of the reasons people um, have spent so much time developing some of these ORMs, um, and they still don't perform the way you want, because what you really want to do is move all logic to the data. And anytime you're going back and forth on a network, it introduces, you have to get concurrency to hide that latency. You have to have these shared data structures. You're not going to go 100 times faster. So use server-side transactional logic, move the logic to the data, not the other way around. Bolt enforces this, um, and, and, but it's best practices for a lot of systems. How do we use all the cores? If I have four machines and they all have four cores, um, I have to scale to four machines because that's table stakes today. It was in 2008 even. I have to be a distributed system or else it's not interesting. Um, so why not distribute to the core? So if I have four machines with four cores, what I do is I treat them like 16 little machines. And I have all my message passing, all my distributed coordination, all my transaction coordination as if there were 16 little machines. Uh, and that allows each of those machines to have very coarse grain locking, very, very high throughput, very high performance. 
um, but it also allows me to have the system treatable as a single image. I can pretend it's a single logical system. Uh, and the kind of catchphrase here is this is concurrency via scheduling, not shared memory. So I, just stopping for a second to, to kind of plug the software we built, I'm really proud of the software we built. Um, it's commodity scale out, active, active HA. We can do millions of operations. These are full serializable ACID transactions distributed across a cluster. Uh, synchronous disk persistence is a surprisingly small hit to that. It's something that I don't think anyone else has done, uh, to my knowledge, the way Volt has. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of work on latency, uh, average latency under a millisecond. Um, Ariel Weisberg, who's here, did a lot of work um, making that the, the sort of five nines of latency. We have a whole other talk on that so that that could be very low. And we have multi-terabyte customers in production. So, but going back to 2008, uh, this bull, we, our first customer, uh, some of the early interest in Volt and some of the, some of the things that shaped where we went with the product uh, was this, this sort of uh, high frequency trading problem that we had where I've got a bunch of different traders. Say, say I've got Jeb here and Jeb has an algorithm that's placing orders on various exchanges and some of those orders are being executed and all these things are messages that are moving over some fiber optic link to the various exchanges. Um, so Jeb knows what's going on with his algorithms, uh, hopefully. Liz knows what's going on with hers. Skip knows what's going on with his. But in aggregate, there's a, there's a problem where the, the organization as a whole doesn't know if everybody has gone long on the same symbol. Everybody says, oh, my position is huge on Microsoft. There's the, the risk management position of that is interesting. And this is a really common problem in finance, and they, they work a lot on this. But this was something that came to Volt, and they said, can you help us solve this problem? And they said the volume on this fiber optic link is 500,000 messages a second. And we said, yeah, that, that's, that's not a problem. Um, but one of the things we had to do in order to support this, in order to support the, you know, what's my position is add materialized views. And materialized views are one of the things that enables a lot of the streaming power of VoltDB. And it's something you don't see uh, as a first class citizen in a lot of other systems. So the interesting thing here is before materialized views, when I want to insert a tuple, the networking overhead and the transaction overhead are substantial. Uh, adding a tuple to a data structure in memory is actually trivial. It takes almost no time in the grand scheme of things. It's not the bottleneck. Um, if I have the second operation, which is I want to know what my position is on Microsoft, the networking and the transaction overhead are the same, same order or so, but the query has to scan, without materialized views, possibly millions of tuples. And that, that, that query, suddenly you've got a 20 millisecond query, a 100 millisecond query, uh, if I want to do that times a bunch of dashboards, each running 100 queries to, to create a report, um, I, I can overflow my system. So adding in materialized views, what I've basically done is I've added, and this is totally not to scale, I've added a second trivial up up, um, operation to the first transaction. So I, I have the same networking overhead, the same transaction overhead. I add a tuple in memory and I update a view. It turns out this is basically free. Once you've got the transactional context, once you've got the network round trip, um, doing more SQL or doing more operations inside that context turns out doesn't affect your throughput that much uh, in VoltDB. And then suddenly the query position is just a lookup in a materialized view. It's a single, B tree, single tree lookup followed by you know, return one tuple. Uh, and this allows us to scale these things to pretty much however you want. It's having materialized views as a first class citizen really enables a lot of these sort of streaming fast data workloads. Another thing that we did was um, add, we added data lifecycle features to Volt TV. This is another thing that's sort of unique to Volt as a first class citizen. So Volt, uh, we have a feature called export and we basically looked at this and looked at ETL tools at the time and a lot of them basically queried every 10, 10 seconds, every 10 minutes. They said, what's changed since the last time I've asked? Because I want to pull that out and put it in my analytics store. And if you're changing things at a million operations a second, asking what's changed in the last 10 seconds is a pretty brutal question. So uh, we've got a push-based export that could be a whole other talk, but it is designed to push data through Volt into an analytics store um, and make Volt part of a sort of a data lifecycle system. So this is not my summary slide, but summary of these kind of high velocity workloads. Uh, nobody wants just a key value store that they can insert and update at a million times a second. What they want to do is they want to understand how their data is changing. So yeah, I want state, I want to update that state, I want to manipulate that state, but I want to understand how that state is being manipulated globally. And, and VoltDB with these features, the materialized view features, the, the processing features enable that. Um, 
at this high velocity, the, the difference between OLTP and streaming gets very blurry. There's usually a lot of each. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a, depends on what view you look at it, whether that's the problem you're talking about. Um, processing and state management go well together. It's something I'll talk about a little bit more going forward. And if you have this fast stateful core, adding features to it um, gives you an integration win rather than stringing together a whole bunch of different products that each sort of do different things. Uh, and this is sort of the Volt marketing pitch, but uh, I actually, you know, as an engineer, I really like it. It kind of breaks the difference between big data and fast data, where fast data is the value is in the, the, the freshness of the data, the temporal aspect of the data. I want to know what's happening now. And, and Beth this morning did a great job kind of explaining a, a perfect use case for fast data, big data, where the machine learning aspect of, of what are the rules, how do we show ads to people at, at DataZoo is a very much a big data problem, but the I have to respond in 10, sec 10 milliseconds and decide what exactly to do is a very much a fast data problem. And we see more and more of these apps as we talk to people with problems that, that have this kind of fast data, big data pattern. So back to streaming. Um, streaming problems. So certainly, what is my global position across equities and trader desks and algorithms and days of the week? Uh, these kind of things get asked a lot. Um, we see a lot of, you know, should this phone call be permitted to go through? Do I have the right permission? Have I paid my bill? Um, is it a number that's real? Is it a number that's in a country I'm allowed to call? Uh, what ad should I show this user? Again, Beth did a great job this morning. We've seen a lot of use cases like that. Um, is my data center healthy? I want to consume log information. I want to get alerting, and I don't want to string together nine systems. We'll talk about that. Um, counting things, apparently, is the example that everyone uses for streaming systems. And the example is like 100 pages long for everyone else, and it's very simple and bold. Um, but that's apparently a streaming problem. I said I would talk about CEP. I'm going to keep this really quick. Uh, complex event processing is sort of where a lot of this streaming stuff started. Um, basically, take a single box push a stream of tuples to it, um, over windows, compete a compute averages, mins, maxes, ratios, detect interesting things. This is where sort of a lot of the streaming stuff started. But the fault tolerance in CEP systems tends to not be fantastic. The scalability seems to be really tough. Uh, they're really getting squeezed. Um, on, on the one side, you've got a lot of these algorithmic traders looking for, you know, double-digit microseconds of latency, they do their own thing. They write custom code. They're, they're, they're the cash-friendly gurus of the world. Um, and on the other hand, you've got um, systems like Vertica that, that do a lot of this analysis faster than they used to. Systems like uh, VoltDB and other kind of transactional systems, Redis, Storm, Spark Streaming, these things are, are not necessarily the low latency of the CEP systems, but they're much more flexible, much more robust. So the, the window for CEP is getting smaller. So the real interesting thing in streaming is, is this kind of, I go to the Apache website and it looks like a restaurant menu of a thousand pieces of software and I click maybe an appetizer, a, an entree, a dessert, maybe a aperitif um, and I string them together and I've got my solution. Um, just leave that there. <laughs> Whoops. So, Take uh, Zookeeper, Kafka, Storm, Cassandra. This is actually sort of a, a, a combination that people will stick together. Uh, Zookeeper does distributed coordination. Uh, Kafka is a message queue system. It's a distributed fancy pants message queue system. It's very, very cool software. All these things are individually. Storm is a stream processing system that, that lets you move processing to the data or move data to the processing in very interesting ways. Um, and, and Cassandra is a, a state management system. Um, a, a data store. And so these things are really, really flexible. You can build a lot of different things. You can swap out one of these components and put a different one in. You've got a lot of power here. Uh, if you're selling services, this is just a gold mine um, because it's, there's so much configuration and different ways to set things up that might be different for different people. Um, it, it's, it's really, you know, I would love to be selling services on this. Um, here's an example. Uh, Zookeeper requires three nodes to get any kind of reasonable consensus. Kafka requires three nodes. Three nodes is sort of a magic distributed systems number. You never want to have two nodes. Um, but all these systems require three nodes, except Storm, which might require more, because uh, it has sort of standalone uh, supervisor nodes. Um, so this is, if I want to do a, a counting application with these systems, and I want to store aggregates in Cassandra, processing in Storm, ingestion with Kafka, and make sure the whole thing is fault tolerant with Zookeeper, 
I might need 13 processes. So Volt kind of does all this. And it's easy to say it doesn't do everything all these systems do, but it has really rich ingestion. It has, uh, we actually embed Zookeeper inside each Volt node, but we use different failure semantics. So they match the failure semantics of the Volt agreement protocols. Uh, we, we do the processing at the data and we do the state management in the system. We also have the same kind of age out that I mentioned before export into a long storm term store that Stor Storm has. And this looks slightly different if you're talking about Spark streaming or anything else, but it's not that different. Um, my biggest dig on, on Storm specifically, it's a little, it's still true for Spark streaming, slightly less true, but is the state is not, uh, the state is basically punted from Storm. Storm is a processing framework. If you want to keep st state, hey, you can use any system you want. Uh, it's, it, take something from the Apache menu, put it there. Uh, so if you pick, you basically get to pick, do I want to manage state at each partitioned Storm processing node, or do I want to manage state globally? And you can do both, but I'm not going to mention that. So if you're, if you're locally partitioned storage, so you've got an in-process data structure, a lot of the kind of counting tutorials do this. Uh, maybe you've got local memcache, local Redis. Uh, you can only see a local slice of the data, and recovering from failure often means starting over, or it means doing something uh, kind of beyond what the storm robustness offers. Uh, so common option is, well, let's go with global state. I'll install Cassandra, HBase, some other system on another cluster. Um, but now inside my storm tuple, I've introduced many milliseconds of latency as I talk to that other system. Um, maybe I'll get lucky and it's local, but um, odds are I've suddenly my taken my system that can process you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of messages a second, and now I can process, uh, in order to do that, I need to have them overlap. I need to have lots and lots of parallelism while I'm hiding that latency. Uh, these systems have different failure semantics. You have to worry about uh, what happens if Cassandra fails, the, no the node you're talking to fails, what happens if Storm fails. Um, they're two kind of different things, and you have to be concerned with what the interactions between them are. Um, if you're using a system that gives you an exactly once guarantee, uh, once you have side effects into internal s external systems, you probably lose that exactly once guarantee unless you're extremely careful. Um, and a lot of the at least once delivery guarantees are very difficult to maintain once you're talking to an external system. Uh, so my pitch basically for, you know, you should use fewer systems um, development is a lot easier. I can install one instance of VoltDB on my laptop. I can, I can run all my development work there. Testing is obviously easier. When I have a problem, I know basically which system is failing. It's my system. Um, the operational use, I mean, obviously I'm running three nodes. I'm not running 17 nodes. Or I can run one system. Operationally, there's much less to worry about. Uh, the latency in Volt blows away the latency in all of these systems. It's, it, by Spark streaming, it's many orders of magnitude. Um, and then the support, uh, it, again, this goes back to test. If something goes wrong, I can call up uh, the people who know Volt, I can call up Volt DB support, and I get, uh, basically that's the problem. I don't have to figure out, is it Cassandra, is it Storm, is it Zookeeper, is it Kafka, is it some other system that I'm running? Um, so that's, that's the end of my talk, thank you. Um, I glossed over a lot of things, so if anybody wants to talk about anything else, I'm happy to do that. Um, Try building a counting app um, on, on VoltDB and on, you know, kind of the, the hot streaming system of the day. Uh, I think you'll find it's really refreshing. Uh, I know Tim Callahan wrote one of our examples that does sort of an American Idol voting style simulation, and it's just a tiny amount of code, and trying to do that on anything else is really crippling. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. I will uh, take questions.